Okay, I think uh, we only have a few seconds left before we get started, so um, we definitely want to start on time for this sort of session. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give you a breakdown of how we're going to do this. So each of the, our speakers will have a different presentation that they have six minutes and 40 seconds to present. Now in a typical Picha Kucha style, it would be 20 seconds per slide, but you guys can do whatever amount of time you want per slide. Um, and at the end of the six minutes and 40 seconds, if they get to that point, I'm going to be playing <coughs> this sound. Let me turn that up. Yeah. So, um, hopefully that'll be lighthearted and fun instead of cruel. All right, and I think we're right on time now, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Stopwatch Session 6 on Acquisitions. Our first topic and speaker is Teresa Teresa, a pilot for digital content acquisitions at the Library of Congress with Jacqueline Hart. Take it away. Yes. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I'm Jackie Hart. I'm a acquisitions and cataloging librarian at the Library of Congress. Sure. Um, and I work in the part of the library that does acquisitions and cataloging, which is called ABA. They're just the like I've been using that a few times. I try to minimize the inside language. Um, and I do material from Canada and Oceania, so my specialties are Hawaiian rare books and organized as ebooks from Canada and Australia. Mm -hmm. They should be timed. Um, so LC rolled out a digital strategy last year, which you may have heard about, and the directives that it lays out are to throw open the chest, treasure chest, connect, and invest in our future. And there are three specific goals in uh, the digital strategy that this initiative contributes to, which are exponentially growing our collections by adding more people to the collection, bringing Lottery to our users by bringing content to users who can come to Washington to access our print collections and ensuring access, enduring access to content by printed by ebooks. So we have a working group that's comprised of people from all over the library. Uh, and over a course of three years, we are piloting, uh, finalizing, and implementing the workflow. Um, and so we have reference libraries providing recommendations and access. We have ABA providing acquisition and description. And we have policy offices and uh, digital specialists providing key support. Um, so it's very important that all of these groups work together and have dedicated time to devoted to this project to keep it going. So the broad strokes of our ebook workflow are recommendation from a reference librarian, and then the content changes hands a couple of times between the ABA and digital specialists for downloading, <coughs> description, acquisition, and um, storage. And then the ebook is ultimately accessible on LOC.gov. Um, and this is provided that the ebook is open access. We have a different platform for content is available on site. Most of our work so far has focused on open access, and this is designed to integrate as much as possible with print workflows, which is why it was too. We ran into a few um, speed bumps, rabbit holes along the way. The first one is ebook cataloging. So we're very good at dealing with print, but ebooks are still pretty new to to catalogers who are experienced, but may sort of feel like trying to play okay with a flamingo and a hedgehog if you're not used to it. But the solutions we've come up with are a record template that can be that is going to roll out in an ILS update this month to all users, um, tips for ebook cataloging using PCC guidelines, and a subgroup dedicated to the graphic aspects of this work. Another one is rights restrictions. That's not something that people have come across in print, but it's very much a thing for ebooks. And so this can be you know, legally it's very confusing to librarians who are used to dealing with this. The solutions we've come up with are copyright form, a copyright form for providers that gets gets it in writing, gets it in plain language, and um, tells us what we can do with the content. And as well as standard language that um, catalogers can use in their records. The final rabbit hole that we've encountered along the way is content transfer access. Um, print is pretty straightforward, but content transfer can be very complicated. Um, and sort of feel like a tea party because you're asking riddles that have no answers. So our solutions we've come up with are different methods for content transfer, including web archiving, digital transfer, and external transfer, um, a suite of access platforms that allow for any kind of copyright restrictions, and improving search for users with tags so you will soon be able to search all the ebooks that are available. So uh, a big part of our pilot and something that I'm personally in charge of is open access ebooks from Canada and Australia. 
So university presses publish many open access books in these countries, but no one is really collecting them and preserving them and making them centrally accessible to users onto the Kindle. Um, so this is the opportunity to centralize and store and make available these ebooks to users everywhere, ideally. Um, the, the university presses are listed here, Australia on the left and Canada on the right. So most or all of the content that these um, university publishers create is um, available open access. So we don't have to buy the print, we can download the ebook. Um, we already had a case where one of the Australian publishers took all of these down all of a sudden, but fortunately we had already harvested most of them. And so they were secured in our servers, even though they were no longer accessible from the publisher's website. So um, we can see already how work it's paid off, and this has been going on for less than a year. Um, this is an example of one of the Canadian ebooks that, uh, that I have acquired and cataloged. It is um, it's about repatriation of Blackfoot cultural heritage. I wanted to highlight this example because, one, you can see where you can download it in the market from LMC.gov. Um, second, this is an example of really important, uh, potentially informal um, cultural heritage pertaining to indigenous communities, which is very important to me. I get a lot of material from Polynesian islands, um, it's the first printed material ever, so it's very important that we preserve this content. So, as a result of our pilot, um, the ebooks are secured and preserved for posterity, um, accessible to users anywhere. It's open access and uh, available to unlimited users. We haven't done any stress testing, but hopefully, <laughs> unlimited users. Um, and that is the, um, the these are the, the main goals that have been um, achieved as a result of the, the pilot that we've under, undertaken. The final year of our, um, ooh, I'm out of time, but basically, people have to keep working together policy, reference, and acquisitions catalog. Uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, I have another one. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, well, delicious ebooks for everyone. Um, this is not ebooks, that looks a um, different kind of ebook that I um, created. This is um, my entry to an ebook project in library school. Perfect <laughs> 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 for the theme that exist. For bearing with me as I got carried away with the theme that's kind of pretty fine. That's it. <laughs> Very good. Do we have any questions for the speaker while we switch to our next speaker? Uh, let me see who is supposed to be next. According to your sketch, the next person will be... But any questions right now while we change the slides? I think it's a very interesting project. And I have you had libraries that uh, start to and that you know have started to add it into their local catalogs and promote it as part of their collections? Not yet, but um, that would that would be great. Um, we are we are a preservation library, not really a user library, but um, yeah, we would love to start those kind of um, uh, partnerships to reach more users. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, next we have Glimpsing into the Future using uh, uh, Curriculum, sorry, I wanted to say circulation. Using curriculum process systems for collection development with Jennifer Young. All right. Hello, I'm Jennifer Young. I'm the resource sharing and acquisitions librarian at East Tennessee State University. Um, just to give you a background, um, our library supports almost 11,000 undergraduate and graduate students and around 600 faculty members. Um, we have a slim staff of 11 librarians and 20 staff members. Currently, I'm the only librarian who works in acquisitions, um, but my time is split between uh, managing Intel and Ray Loan and being head of collection development. Um, because we've had a mostly flat budget for the past several years, uh, most of our budget is um, allocated to electronic resources. Uh, this leaves only each year 1.5% to um, our print monograph collection, which is a very small amount. Um, so to achieve efficiency um, in purchasing material that supports our university's curriculum, um, it's important for us to receive up-to-date information on curriculum <coughs> changes and new courses and programs coming into the university. So this is a statement from our collection development policy that basically says we expect the faculty in our departments to contribute to collection development in the library. Um, However, our issue is that the faculty are 
not actively participating in collection development <laughs> in the library. Um, this is probably due to a couple of factors, of course, one being that faculty themselves are very busy and they may not. Um, this collection development policy was before me, so I don't know how this information was distributed to faculty and if they even know this expectation is there. Um, another factor is currently we have no library liaisons, and we used to have a library coordinator in each department, but that kind of went away over time as well. So um, it's pretty much for right now just me doing all of the print monograph and selecting the material with maybe 10 faculty giving me input. Oh, that was supposed to be for that slide, so <laughs> I skipped a slide, I'm sorry. So, um, a liaison program cannot be developed overnight, obviously, um, it takes time, so <coughs> in the meantime, as we are developing our program, I thought it would be a good idea to utilize a system that we already have in place, which is um, the curriculum processing, processing system. At my university, we use curriculum. Um, so the library has been added as a step in the workflow, so all new courses, course modifications, and new programs are reviewed by me first. Um, before they um, even go to the department's dean, the college dean. Sorry. So the curriculum proposals are a wonderful source of data. We receive their bibliography, which includes um, material that they think are important to the students or used to create the course, the course topics for the course, what they expect the students to learn, and the type of assignments they're going to be um, using in the course. So how do I use this information? Um, I review the bibliography, purchase anything they're recommending to the students that we don't already own. I also create a list of journals and databases listed that um, we don't own, and we use that in our annual budget report each year, so we can document um, the department and the specific faculty that are making that request. Um, I also review the topics, which is the time-consuming part, because I'm not a subject expert in hardly any of the subject areas. Um, so it takes a lot of time, but I purchase in areas that I feel are insufficient or need to be updated. So additionally, we get the course types, so we can see the mix um, of new courses coming in that are online versus in person. We see the type of assignments, um, how many are research-based, and what they might need from the library, as well as the faculty contact for the originator. Um, so I've also been using Curriculog not just for collection development, but as a tool for marketing. Um, I'm able to review the course and submit to the faculty member um, <coughs> suggestions that they may have not known about in the library, especially new resources um, that I can send, and it's been a great way to promote our new subject guides um, to the faculty, especially our newer faculty. It's also been a way to try to reconnect with our teaching faculty. So we don't have currently have that um, connection in interlibrary, I'm sorry, I also work in interlibrary loan, in acquisitions for collection development. So I'm really trying to regain their trust. Um, I think we had some cuts in the past that kind of broke the relationship um, that they're still, we're still kind of trying to get through. Um, so I'm really hoping that reaching out to them, letting them know that we're trying to be proactive in the collection um, and meet the needs of their students, then that will help with the relationship. Because ultimately, we want them to see the library as their curriculum partner, um, as a not just somebody who's not there to help them, but we're, we have the uh, goal of helping the students as well. So back to the collection development part, you may ask, is it working? And I think we've been doing this for two years now. Um, and I think it's working because 100% of the books that have been purchased, purchased using this strategy have been circulated at least once, with 20% being circulated at least three times. I think the success is also <coughs> the number of departments being represented in our collection development. So the year before I came on board, only 14 departments um, material in the print collection were purchased for. Um, the year I started evaluating curriculum, um, I was able to purchase for 26 different departments, and then this past year, 29. So the challenges are that uh, I'm not a subject expert. I um, am developing a collection for 46 different departments, which um, is pretty hard. <laughs> and um, 
the faculty expect quick turnaround on their proposals, some within 24 hours. So I'm having to um, do one review for that purpose, and then I save all the data I need for collection development to be done later. So moving forward, we hope to develop a liaison program to help with this and further analyze the circulation data to show the benefit of the time I'm putting into this project. So moving forward, ultimately what I'm trying to do is um, rebuild a bridge between the library and our teaching faculty. Wonderful. Any questions for Arjun? Yes. In the three years you've been doing this, we started doing the circulation. Do you have um, how many items have you purchased? You know, <coughs> um, for this, it's been about fifty titles per year. Okay. So, and it's been it's that was the first year, and the second year, um, I think closer to seventy. So it's still small, but we have a purchase around 300. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions while we pull up the slides? Okay. Next we have reduce, reuse, recycle, revise ongoing efforts to create environmentally friendly acquisition practices at an, at an academic library with Nicole Wood. Okay. That's on you. Hello, I am the Collection Management Librarian at Austin B. State University in Clarksville, Tennessee. We are a mid-sized public university, and we have also had a stagnant budget for several years, which is very important for understanding why we had to make some of the choices we made uh, as we decided uh, to develop a plan to become more sustainable. So the American Library Association says that libraries, by their very nature, are green in that their resources are shared by the larger community, but libraries can extend the environmental benefit further through both sustainable practices, which reduce the environmental impact of day-to-day -day operations, and green buildings, which seek to minimize consumption of resources either in their building or their operation. If you have a staggered <coughs> budget, redesigning your building is not an option. So we looked at sustainable practices to reduce our environmental impact day-to-day, -day, but even those changes had to be cost neutral. And so we started with the most basic sustainability mantra there is. We all learned this in elementary school. Reduce, reuse, recycle. <coughs> How is this implemented in a library? Uh, the first step is to reduce. If you don't make the waste at all to begin with, you don't have to worry about uh, getting rid of it in a sustainable way. So some of the changes we implemented we now purchase all materials in bulk if possible, no matter how long it takes for them to get to us. We have educated our faculty that you can't always get what you want right away. Um, and we use we buy used materials when we can't get items in bulk. So bulk shipping reduces one shipping waste because you're having fewer deliveries. Two, it reduces packaging waste because everything is shipped in one large box instead of a bunch of individually wrapped books. And it also reduces general waste production because we are clear cutting less forests because the books we're buying are already in production. Uh, two, we made email receipts standard. We do not print receipts for anyone at all unless they explicitly request it for whatever reason. Uh, Receipt paper is not recyclable. It's automatically going to a landfill. And three, we now consider seller location, and we request that vendors use recyclable packaging if they aren't already. Our bulk vendors, like Gobi or Great, they send everything in these cardboard boxes wrapped in paper. When you start using smaller vendors like uh, A Books or eBay, where the vendor isn't dictating what packaging it goes in, that's when you get books shrink wrapped in plastic, wrapped in bubble wrap, in a plastic bag. And so almost all of these smaller vendors have an option where you can contact the vendor directly. It's a button and you can say, don't put this in bubble wrap. It's a hardback book. Um, but this is just an example of how you can limit your seller location on some of these uh, smaller vendor websites. This is from A Books. I've limited my location to Tennessee because that's where our library is. And I've limited it to all sellers with a five-star rating, and I still have almost 3,000 vendors to choose from when looking for my books. So that goes to show there are a lot of these small used book vendors near you. You just have to take an extra step to figure out who they are and where they are. Uh, you can also produce carbon offsets. Any transportation automatically produces carbon emissions that go into the atmosphere. Some vendors will offer 
the option to carbon balance your purchase in the checkout. This is from Better World Books. This is a purchase I made a few weeks ago for $400. The cost to offset that carbon for the shipping <coughs> was three cents added to my purchase. The accounting office did not contact me to ask me what that three cents was for. And this money goes to fund projects that pull carbon out of the atmosphere, either by planting trees or methane capture or by building uh, more charging stations for electric vehicles. Um, if your vendor does not have this built into the checkout process, you can go find a shipping calculator somewhere online. This is from carbonfund.org. It's the one that I found to be the most easy to use. This is just a sample of an estimate. I wanted to know how much it would cost to offset 30 shipments that weighed 50 pounds each that were shipped over 1,000 miles. The cost was $1. I just paid that myself. Um, you can reuse. Uh, there are supposed to be pictures here, but that's okay. Um, you can sell books that you read. We donate ours to the public library and they use them in their book sales because as a public university, we are not allowed to make a profit. Uh, you can reuse packaging. All of the packaging that I get in acquisitions either goes to our interlibrary loan office to be used for interlibrary loan or our circulation department to be used to send books to our distance students or to the post office if we just have a surplus of boxes and the post office happily reuses them. And you can also find alternate uses for things that would be waste. There should be a picture of book covers uh, in a collage that was used by our art department. Our art department loves to get our old newspapers, journals, and book covers for their freshman art classes to make various projects. But uh, you can also think outside of the box. We've partnered with our food pantry and the local farmer's market, and if they have any food that is about to be stale but is still good, produce or packaged food, they will send it to us. We live in, we, our school is in a food desert, so there's not a good option for students to get fresh food. So we'll just throw all of this produce out at the front of our library and students can come grab it and go so that we don't send this food to the landfill. Um, we're almost out of time. Uh, so if you can't <coughs> reduce your waste or reuse your waste, of course you want to recycle it. Um, this is just an example of how much trouble you might run into if you want to recycle something and you can't. Books are especially hard to recycle because they are mixed material items. They are paper, either paper and plastic or paper, cardboard and cloth, and you have to have a recycling agency that can break those books down. When I tried to start to recycle, Clarksville did not have this option, and so I, these are just all of the different things that I tried, I reached out to our campus recycling, they couldn't do it, the city recycling couldn't do it. I asked our sustainability committee to ship the books to Nashville and they said that would produce more waste than we would save. I asked for a debinding machine so I could rip the books apart myself and at least recycle the paper. Um, and then I asked our local public library to recycle the materials and they said yes, but that we would have to deliver the books and we didn't have the ability to do that. And finally, I made such a fuss that our campus Sustainability <laughs> came back to us and said, we figured it out, we'll do it for you, just stop asking people. Um, so, I, the moral of the story is, keep trying and eventually someone will get so annoyed that they'll help you. Um, but that is the steps that we have taken recently to significantly reduce the amount of waste that we produce. Any questions for uh, Jennifer? No, wait. Nicole, I lost uh, track of the names. I apologize. Any questions for Nicole while we switch the presentations? Next slides. Good stuff. Have you done any reporting out about um, how much? carbon offsetting or reducing, reducing, uh, reusing and recycling you've done in your local community? Um, we haven't pulled the numbers yet. I have the amount of carbon that we've offset, but I don't know specifically yet what that would translate into as far as like tons of the air. Right, right. But we do have the base data that needs to pick it up. Okay. Next we have incoming strategies for surviving the barrage of vendor communications with Edward uh, Leonard, and I look forward to this topic. Okay. Yeah, so I'm Edward Leonard from Virginia Tech, and I've been Associate Director for Collection Management there since 2008. So Virginia Tech is a comprehensive research university. We're located in Southwest Virginia. 
We have a broad range of programs, and you can see some of our other statistics. We've also been in the news lately this year for a um, big jump in our enrollment for the freshman year class that was unanticipated, so that's been a fun thing to deal with. So I did want to just take a moment with the title. I was trying to be funny, but um, obviously what we're doing does not compare in any way to what the soldiers are facing. But um, Virginia Tech has a long history of military service, and we do still have an active Corps of Cadets with about 1,200 members. But the challenge, of course, is that that constant influx, they just keep coming, and it feels, you know, what am I going to do with all of these and how, how to deal with them? And yet, within that, there are communications that are important and we need to address them. And this is just an image of a few random samplings of communications that came in in the past month. Um, quite a range, and most of them are all competing for your attention and demanding sort of immediate action of some kind. So trying to analyze the issue, I compiled a spreadsheet, and I did a four-week period. I started when the proposal got accepted, and I ran it through the day before our fall semester started, and my schedule got even busier. So. And I sought to include a variety of data points. You can see here, most of them were fairly straightforward. The final one, the relevance rating, is a bit more subjective, and so I'll talk about that a little more. And basically, with regard to the relevance, I tried to assign a ranking at the time it was received, and you can see the scale that was used. And items on the lower end, I often discarded, sometimes fairly quickly. Those that I thought were relevant or useful for future reference, of course, I kept. And then there were a small number that required actual action. So the biggest surprise to me was that the total number of messages during that four-week period was a lot less than I expected. It sometimes feels like it's that much in a few days. But the actual number is here, 165. And just one note was that the, for that count, I did not include the back and forth of some communications, like setting up a vendor visit. So email was by far the most common type of communication. And that is useful in many cases because it provides uh, documentation. Phone is also good though for when you have questions or want to follow up on things. The majority of those contacts or communications were initiated by the vendor. When it was from the library, it tended to be on a specific item or trying to address a problem. With regard to the types of messages, the large majority were generic in nature. And for the targeted messages, I was actually quite generous in what I counted as a targeted. So, and here you can see some of the categories. And this slide has a little extra time so you have a chance to read it. But um, things that would tended to be more important, like customer support or subscription renewals or usage data, often were fairly minor. A lot of it was just general sales pitch, new <coughs> titles, um, things of that nature that really weren't that significant in the big picture. And corresponding to that, the relevancy rankings, there tended to be a lot of things that were fairly low on that. And only a relatively small percentage actually required action of some kind, so that was some good news. So based on what I found, I tried to come up with a few guiding principles. The first there, everything does not warrant your full attention, and I think that's an important one. Also from a time management perspective, it can be helpful to deal right away with items that can be handled quickly. And then the third was to try to take active steps to reduce those unwanted communications. And some tips here along the lines of that last one. Try the unsubscribe button, that does work many times. If it doesn't, option two there, set up spam filters to knock them out. And also things like when you're registering for a conference, including this one, there was a checkbox of whether you want to be contacted by vendors. And everybody loves free stuff, but raffles and drawings, all that, you're giving out your contact information. 
I think it's also very important to tell vendors <coughs> what you want. They want, at least the good ones, want to work with us and hear that from us. And so what your preferences are, what products are actually of interest to you, and also times of the year that are good to hear from them. So I mentioned the large number of communications that I was anticipating versus what I saw. And many of them actually turned out to be other types of things, email lists, listserv, Google groups, automatic notifications, etc. So some of that I did scale back on after looking at my communications in more detail. So kind of a final bit of advice keeping with our original theme here. Uh, keep calm and carry on. You will survive these the barrage of communications. Thank you very much and be glad to take any questions. Do we have any questions while we swap up the slides? All right, thank you very much. Have you uh, found that it actually has changed how you're interacting with your email or the number of emails that you get? Yes, I know it's not very long. What surprised me was how many of them were coming from a relatively small number, so yeah. by trying to unsubscribe or filter those, and I'm including things in there like uh, school library supplies and yeah. things. It's like, as an academic librarian, but I just don't need to see that. So. All right, well, thank you very much. Okay. Our next and final speaker is Jeff uh, Take a left in books using the lyrics of Bob Dylan to understand the changing times of collection development with Tom Carroll. Thank you. Now, I have to start by saying that you're not going to hear Bob Dylan singing during this presentation. <laughs> this might disappoint some of you. Some of you might be relieved that you don't have to listen to Bob Dylan. Um, my daughter advised me not to use audio clips. She said, too much can go wrong. And my wife insisted that I don't sing. <laughs> so um, I'm the question management librarian at Franklin and Marshall College. I've been there for about 35 years. And I'm a huge Bob Dylan fan. Now, back in 1965, Bob Dylan famously went electric at the Newport Folk Festival. Folk purists were outraged, but that was a defining moment for folk music, folk rock, and everything that came afterwards. 20 years or so later, libraries went electric, <laughs> and things haven't been the same. People booed Bob Dylan when he made this change. People booed us. Where's our catalog? What have you done to the car catalog? <laughs> so this got me thinking about uh, Bob Dylan's lyrics and how some of them can perfectly relate to changes I've seen over my uh, long library career. Now, as a quick aside, I should mention that also in 1965, Bob Dylan released one of his most famous songs, Like a Rolling Stone. That song clocked in at 6 minutes 13 seconds. And it confounded radio disc jockeys because they didn't know what to do with it. They were used to much shorter songs. Six minutes, 13 seconds is almost as long as the time I have allocated <laughs> here. So if this presentation doesn't work quite well, you might have wished that you would listen to the song instead. <laughs> now, I'm going to start with this lyric, which, uh, of course, is Bob Dylan talking about library budget. Money doesn't talk, it's uh, I use this on library class guides for economics courses, and some of the students uh, recognize the name Bob Dylan, which is good. Now, academic librarians have to work with faculty for better or worse, and I think uh, Mr. Dylan could have been writing about the librarian's liaison roles with these lines. You've been with the professors, and they've all liked your looks. With great lawyers and scholars, you have discussed lepers and crooks. You've been through all of F. Scott Fitzgerald's books. You're very well read. It's well known. <laughs> and 
Speaking of faculty, some of us might remember how hard it was to persuade them to give up their treasured print journals and to embrace the online access to articles. Something is happening here. You don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? But then, more and more and more changes came down the line. Librarians and faculty were confronted with approval plans, e-books, streaming video, open access publications, and so much more. So there's too much confusion. I can't get no relief. Bob Dylan um, has been quoted frequently in law review articles and even in Supreme Court cases. And so in, when I work with uh, legal classes, I use some of his lines. Here is uh, something that he might have said related to libraries and copyright issues and fair use. To live outside the law, you must be honest. And what about all those problematic license agreements that uh, we have to sign and even sometimes read? <laughs> to live outside the law, you must be honest. I, I don't mind using a good lyric twice. <laughs> now, Bob Dylan has also written about libraries' weeding and deselection uh, policies. I must have been mad. I never knew what I had until I threw it all away. This is, <laughs> these photos are from our current collection assessment project. Now, Bob Dylan is not known as a warm and fuzzy guy, even though he's written some really nice love songs, so I thought he might be the perfect person to touch on the rather contentious relationship between librarians and publishers and vendors. And this is what he might have said. Just an example. You got a lot of nerve to say you are my friend. Or maybe even this, the power and greed and corruptible seed seem to be all that there is. But happily, things are getting better in this relationship. And today, this is what uh, we're starting to hear from publishers' reps. Do you want to make a deal? <laughs> so finally, what, what does the future really hold for libraries? Of course, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. Now, I've had a great library career, and as I'm starting to inch closer to retirement, these lines kind of came into my head. Here I sit so patiently, waiting to find out what price you have to pay to get out of, going through all these things twice. <laughs> So thank you all, and thank you, Bob. <laughs> if you're interested in exploring his songs and you can't afford that massive lyrics book, this website is essential. And people who gave me some good advice. <laughs> thank you.